Hello everyone, uh, I'm Yuan Trantang. Uh, I'm senior associate at Peter and Kim in the Geneva office. And I'm also a member of the executive committee of RAI, the Rising Arbitrators Initiative. So <clears throat> I'm delighted to be here today um, <clears throat> to be speaking with Mrs. Su Chung Lin. Uh, she is the secretary general of the KCAB International, the Korean um, Com Commercial Arbitration Board International. And um, she has accepted to tell us a bit about the institution, but also its practice in relation to appointments today. So I will start with uh, introducing uh, Sue a little bit. So as I said, she's the current Secretary General of the KCAB International. And before that, she also had a long, long-standing career um, as a leader of the Korean arbitration landscape. Uh, immediately prior to the KCAB International, she was a partner at Bay Kim and Lee. Uh, she actually was a partner there for 16 years. And as a consul, she has had a long career of representing clients in numerous high value complex arbitrations. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> and so she, she helped uh, shape the, the Korean arbitration practice as it is today. Uh, she also has experience uh, in investment state arbitration uh, as well as in commercial arbitration. And she has written and co-authored a number of leading uh, published pieces on uh, arbitration law and practice in Korea. Uh, she is also currently a member of the SIAC User Council National Committee for Korea. She was a member of the ARB 40 subcommittee under the IBA, where she uh, contributed to a number of projects uh, by that subcommittee. She's currently on the panel list of arbitrators of the KCAB, and she also serves as advisory member of uh, the Legal Assistant Board for Overseas Business under the Ministry of Justice, also as a Director of International Affairs of the Korean Society of Law, and uh, she also serves on the International Committee of the Seoul Bar Association. So I will stop here um, and just add that uh, you are also a native all fluent in four languages too, uh, including Spanish and Portuguese. Um, so you are you are very uh, busy. You have a lot of responsibilities, uh, obviously, which must fill your agenda too. So again, on behalf of Rai, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to speaking to us, of speaking to us uh, today. Um, it's so my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, to start, uh, Sue, uh, maybe it would be nice to know a little bit more about you. So do you think uh, you can just tell us uh, what brought you first into arbitration and what kept you in uh, this field all this time? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me and also for that very generous um, introduction of what I've been doing when what I am currently doing. Well, I started arbitration not as my initial practice, um, but it was a practice that I first encountered around the fourth year of my practice. Usually in Korea, when you're qualified as a lawyer, you are considered, or at least back when I started, you're considered to be a generalist. So everything from going to the local court um, and defending small domestic cases to providing advisor, advisory work for international contracts. So those were stuff that I did. Um, but around the time I became a third year associate and moving on to my fourth year associate, I discovered international arbitration. And I thought it was a field that just matched what what I felt were my strengths, which was being a qualified Korean lawyer, native Korean speaker, but at the same time um, as someone who had a very multicultural background. Um, I grew up outside of Korea most of my life before going to college and, um, and majoring law. So I thought I could, through my profession, act or function as a bridge between the, the Korean legal uh, community and the world out, outside of Korea. And it's been wonderful so far. Um, I was, I had the wonderful experience of practicing for over 16 years in one of the major arbitration powerhouses um, in Korea. Um, and uh, every, all the cases I had, had been 
really precious to me in terms of, of building up my experience in, in this field. And I guess here I am as a secretary general of KCAB International, which is a part of my story, which I probably will be able to talk to you about more as we progress through the in interview. Thank you very much for sharing uh, your background with us, So, uh, Yes, yeah, so indeed, um, as we mentioned, I mean, uh, as a, as a more international lawyer on the arbitration scene, uh, what I understand is that you also were one of the pillars of you know, the evolution of the arbitration industry in Korea as a whole. And uh, it was also, it also happened you know, in the context of uh, a regional development also in Asia with arbitration hubs popping up and uh, competing with each other and uh, against uh, the arbitration hubs uh, in Europe or in the Americas. And um, so can you tell us a bit uh, about your perspective, you know, of this evolution, uh, this fast evolution of arbitration in Korea and also the role of KCAB in that evolution um, would be interesting to know from you. Sure, um, I think I was really lucky to be in the right place in the right time. Uh, when I started arbitration, international arbitration in 2005, that was a time when Korean companies just started to have their major international disputes that spawned from mergers and acquisition or shareholding agreements uh, that they executed with uh, foreign shareholders back in the Asian financial crisis. And the fact that the Korean parties, instead of trying to run away to local litigation or just succumbing to litigation outside of, uh, outside of Korea and in other countries, they chose to fight their disputes through international arbitration. And they did this in a way that was rather unique, I think. A lot of times they, most of the times, at least the, the Korean companies that I counseled for, um, chose to have Korean law firms as their lead counsel. Um, sometimes co-counseling with international firms, but in terms of um, designing their strategy for the case, they had uh, the Korean law firms really delve into the case and learning some of the new techniques in international arbitration, which until then were unfamiliar to lawyers in Korea. And, and this phenomenon continued for many years. And the end result was that not only did the Korean companies become more sophisticated about this new mechanism called international arbitration, we now have an entire generation of Korean lawyers or Korean law firm practitioners who are, are experts and internationally renowned experts in this area. Um, the, the fact that international arbitration grew so quickly and matured so fast in Korea actually led to a great shakeup in the Korean Commercial Arbitration Board in that the, the institution, which uh, so far has been the sole arbitral institution in Korea, um, realized that they needed to revamp their international work so that it meets the requirements and expectations of international users. Um, the evolution of the institution started with uh, enacting a separate international arbitration rules back in 2007, um, which led to a great increase to the number of international case caseloads. Um, in 2018, there was also another major change in the structure of the institution, whereby the international work was carved out to a separate independent division, which is now KCAB International. And um, I was invited to be its first secretary general. I think the fact that there's a broad industry-wide change uh, and, uh, and more deeper focus in international work uh, signals that there is a great deal of convergence in terms of how arbitration is practiced. But at, at the same time, it, it sends a signal to the market that Asian companies are interested and ready and capable of, um, of meeting um, the challenges that legal disputes can bring them and they, they can take these disputes to international arbitration. 
Uh, thank you. It, it's true that uh, uh, Korea, I mean, from the, a very external point of view, stands out as a, I know I'm a Peter and Kim, but I'm from the Geneva office, so I still have a very European point of view, and uh, Korea stands out as some, um, uh, um, one of the industry that managed to uh, do capacity building so fast that they managed to uh, become a market of their own, like in such little time, that is pretty impressive. Um, so thank you very much for explaining a bit the context of the evolution of the KCAB and of the KCAB international branch. Um, so now to get into the question that interests uh, our audience a lot. Uh, so I, I would just uh, remind that uh, our audience uh, is composed, uh, our members are composed at least of um, arbitration uh, practitioners who are under 45, uh, but who have more than seven years of experience who have either uh, received their first appointment or seek their first appointment, but want to generally expand on their, their arbitration, arbitrator practice and uh, improve their, arbitrate, their, their rising arbitrator skills. Uh, so we are representing this young generation of, uh, of arbitrators. And uh, of course, I mean, we are naturally very interested in uh, the appointment process of institutions. So, um, can I ask you uh, how many appointments you generally uh, make in a given year, and uh, if you have any worse uh, uh, trend worth mentioning, such as the region, um, like expertise that you're, that is particularly uh, frequently uh, sought in appointments? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so the KCB has two types of works. So one is the domestic side of the institution, and the other is the international side of, of the, the case work. Um, obviously, the domestic side is done through the domestic team, which is separate from the international case. Um, together with the international case, the domestic case, um, if you put the two numbers together, there is an average of anywhere from 400 to 450 cases per year in the institution. Among these cases, uh, 400 some cases, about 70, 75% are international cases. The interesting thing about international cases is that usually if it's a three panel member case, the parties nominate their arbitrators. So it is more a matter of the institution confirming the nominations as opposed to act, to nominate or act, to appointing, uh, having institutional appointments without any nominations. Uh, I don't have a, a, a specific statistics on exactly the percentage of how many appointments are done by the institutions versus how many appointments are done through confirmation of nominations. But I think there is more, the, more uh, institutional appointments than there are party nominations. This because this is because uh, many of the cases that KCAB oversees has been small or mid-sized cases which call only for a sole arbitrator. And it's very rare that parties agree on a specific name if they have only one arbitrator to, to pick. Uh, so usually in those cases, especially when it's say a diverse um, party or there is a diversity among the parties in terms of nationality, uh, the KCAB secretary usually does the appointments. Um, so I guess around the 70 or 75 cases, 50 or 50 or so, 40 or 50 so are done by the cases um, are, are have, a, have arbitrators that are appointed by the secretariat. As for the trends worth mentioning, um, I'm very proud to say that at least during my term, at least starting my term, I had I, I put a lot of emphasis when we appoint arbitrators on the diversity, diversity not only on gender, but also on the age um, difference and also on the region of, of where these arbitrators come from. Uh, we would like to see the work being spread out as far as possible in order to create and train the new generation of arbitrators. Um, previously, KCB, and I think this is the case of many other institutions, previously, the, the many institutions were very conscious about making sure that the arbitrators are people who are already known and established in the market. Um, and because of that, there 
seems to have been a smaller group of people who had continuously been appointed. But I think the trend has definitely shifted towards diversity um, in various levels, um, including gender and age. Uh, so uh, the, there's definitely a higher percentage of new appointments done during the last three years since I was in the as a, since I was a secretary general. One another interesting thing about Korea or about KCB is that many of the cases managed by KCB uh, are disputes where at least one of the parties are uh, Korean or have a Korean interest or like a Korean shareholder owning a foreign company. And because of the desire of each party to avoid uh, the same nationality arbitrators, uh, parties end up requesting that a third national be considered before uh, any other nationalities, before the nationality of any one of the parties. Um, many of the cases have contracts where the governing law is Korean law. Mm -hmm. And because of that necessity to avoid Korean national, uh, nationals, but at the same time desire to have someone who is more uh, knowledgeable in civil law, uh, tradition, legal systems, we find ourselves appointing third nationals that understand civil law that is similar to Korean law. And, Hence, we have quite a number of lawyers from Germany, sometimes Swiss, Japan, and countries that have that share the same civil law roots in their legal traditions. Uh, thank you. So it's very interesting because um, because I, I saw actually in the report for 2020 that you had uh, among the secretary appointment a percentage of 23 percent of uh, first appointees. Uh, and this, I, I, I was really surprised and uh, you confirmed all of this that actually you have smaller cases which you know call for also sometimes like uh, younger more available uh, arbitrators um, so you, you mentioned to us that uh, so your caseload uh, often has a tie to Korean law so that the, we have the civil law that is desirable uh, the, the civil law expertise um, do you look at other things when you look at the dispute to decide whether it is uh, safe to uh, to make a first to appoint a, a first appointee uh, in that case? Do you look at the amount in dispute or the, the the I mean the fact of the case, the complexity of the legal questions, this type of uh, issues? Sure. When we say first time appointment, um, we don't appoint. We don't mean that we appoint people with no experience with an arbitration um, okay. our criteria of course is to make sure that individual is someone who has sufficient experience as in this field just not as an arbitrator but um, many of the people we know the young uh, arbitrators on the panel that we know are people who have for the longest time either acted as second chair of a very major arbitration practice this group in the region who um, probably has done most of the work, um, except for the upfront advocacy, um, most of the work in deciding what is procedure correct, um, what is the proper way to deal with evidence, uh, when is the right time to comment or to give opportunity to comment. And the, the first time appointments are usually limited to names that are familiar as counsel and um, as people who have shown that they are they are being trusted by clients and their their large large practice groups to be reliable in conducting a case from the beginning to the end. So um, if we see a case that's relatively small in size, which means that the remuneration is is um, is proportionate to the case. So we might, might not be suitable for the older, more established arbitrators. But at the same time, I realize this is a case that the arbitrator has to be someone who has sufficient 
more than sufficient experience in leading parties through the process. We, of course, consider as first priority names of the relatively younger practitioners who've been in this field for many, many years, but just didn't have their first opportunity as an arbitrator. Um, a lot of people ask if there is a maximum amount in dispute for first time appointments. Um, for example, if it's over 3 million, 4 million, is there like a ban or is, is, it, is it forbidden for us to have first time appointments? Um, I don't think the amount per se is the it is a criteria to decide whether we'll have first time appointment or not. I think it's more um, it's more the the the, the complexity of, of the case, um, but not complexity and the and the fact that this is a case that would be good for for a first time appointment that influence our decision to try to look for first time appointments in the first place. And then you mentioned a bit like uh, the pool you draw from, you know, for these first appointment appointees, you know, who are actually like very experienced lawyers already in the field, but uh, have just not acted as arbitrator yet. Or do you also have a draw from the pool of uh, people who work more have worked more for arbitrators because uh, you are also close to Singapore and a lot of places where you have a lot of chambers in which arbitrators sit and uh, employ these uh, younger lawyers who sometimes stayed for years drafting awards. So they may not be visible to you as counsel because you don't see them in the, in the case, uh, in the case here, because as counsel, but do you, are you in touch with this community as well of uh, secretaries uh, slash rising arbitrators because they have so much experience? Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't have like an ongoing relationship with any particular group of chambers or their secretary, uh, their tribunal secretaries. Uh, but we find that in the recent years, these tribunal secretaries slash um, councils for in, in the chambers, um, they are quite active in, um, in, in reaching out to institutions. Um, a lot of times we have applications from um, the young uh, arbitral secretary or, or arbitral secretaries to add their names to the panel um, and the panel of, of KCAB arbitrators. And once your name is on the, the database, is, um, of course, you'll be considered if there is a case that is appropriate um, that for that that particular characteristics of the of the arbitrator. Uh, for example, nationality or governing law, or maybe the region of residence, that also is something that we would consider. And we will consider them because they are those those the databases in um, in our system when we consider appointments. Um, yes, yeah, so so I would have a question about residents as well, but maybe because you, you mentioned also like, I mean, the, the KCAB panel, for the audience, can, can you uh, re remind us, you know, um, what are the main criteria for uh, applying to uh, be admitted into the, the panel? And I mean, actually like, whether do you have to, always, uh, I mean, do you always select, you know, when you appoint the secretary or make appointments, do you always select uh, from the, the, the KCAD panel or not? And if you have other venues than that, you know, to, to get your profile visible to the KCAD secretariat. Sure. Um, so KCB panel is not a, a closed list. So we do make off panel appointments. Um, but there's a, a lot of convenience um, that is associated to being part of the panel. Um, first of all, your, your information as an arbitrator is included in the system, which allows the KCB secretariat to search or maybe sort through um, in terms of the nationality or your, the, your legal background. Um, and of course, the, your your organization, because organization is one uh, element that secretariats must consider when deciding conflict. Um, so there is merit in being part of the KCB or being included in the KCB panel. But uh, at the same time, if your name is already known out there, 
um, you will easily get appointments from, uh, from parties who have KCAB cases, even if your name is not on the panel yet. Um, and about residence, um, so uh, yes, under Article 24, this is one of the, the criteria that the Secretary should consider when appointing uh, arbitrators. Um, so you, you say that, yes, uh, they, they, there is a, you, you often a tie to Korean to Korea, so I guess also by the seats sometimes, by uh, the, the, the law applicable, but in terms of residence, what, what, what was the idea in mind that the arbitrators can actually attend hearings and meetings in uh, in Seoul, or, or can you explain to us a bit more uh, what was the rationale underlying the the, the residence criteria? Uh, yes, of course. Um, the, the answer is pretty simple. It's it's the the additional costs to the parties. Um, so obviously, an arbitrator, um, if they need to travel or come or spend their time hearing cases, that means additional expenditures that the parties will have to either pay in advance or settle as the, the award is approaching. Um, and because parties who sign up for arbitration have a, a certain level of expectation that arbitration will be cost effective, um, we would, we of course would have to consider what additional costs the parties would have to bear besides the remuneration of the arbitral tribunal. So in the days when parties expected to have a face-to-face -face meeting with a tribunal, from the CMC to the merits, or even for closing, um, it, it meant that if the unless the parties had a large case where they had sufficient financial resources, um, if, if it was a party that may or had the appearance that would feel a bit of resistance to the extra cost uh, of. Um, of, of the arbitrator's travel, um, the, the fact that someone lived closer in a nearby city or even in the, within the same city would, would serve as a merit in the appointment. So it was more about the party's expectation okay. about costs. Okay, and the thing is that, do you think that uh, next time the KCAB would revise its rules? Do you think that the pandemic and also the fact that actually, I mean, um, I mean, I, I work with Korean colleagues and I mean, for me, they're like the superstars of virtual hearings. I mean, they're like the most prepared in the, arbitra the global arbitration community for virtual hearings. That plus the pandemic and I guess like this, I mean, the change in the expectations of the parties in this regard. Uh, do you think that this would maybe something that would change or have less relevance uh, in the next edition of the rules? Mm, so, Yes, I mean, if you have, if we have parties who continually expect that hearings, even after the pandemic, will be conducted virtually, the fact that there will be no additional costs for the arbitrator to conduct a hearing um, would definitely point to in favor of of making appointments without any regard to. To their geographic location. Um, obviously, time zone will still be an issue because if both parties um, are working in the Northeast Asia time zone, um, they would want to have their hearings at a more reasonable hour, which would which may mean the arbitrator will have to wake up at 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, but of course, that that's something that uh, individuals may want to accommodate. But yes, with virtual hearings, I think there is a broader uh, pool of arbitrators to, to select from when making appointments. Definitely true. And, uh, and I mean, very closely related to that, uh, even before the pandemic, I had heard uh, from institutions in Asia that sometimes applicants, you know, to the panels, they were uh, in their application stating that they are willing to pay for, for the cost of traveling, the, the traveling costs and for the expenses, uh, just because they really, they really want these first appointments, these, uh, you know, to get to know, uh, to be known in the region. So um, would, this, would this be something you, uh, is this something you have seen in applications? Is this something that you welcome or do you think that it's a bit unrealistic um, to, to do that? Well, actually, that's a point that 
I had considered for a short time, temporarily considered when we were redoing our application form, um, I had for a while considered whether to add a, a tick in the box feature where uh, our young arbitrators would say they're interested in traveling at their own costs um, if it increased their possibility of being appointed. But I later on thought against it. Um, the reason I did that is that I, I think it adds a burden to the young arbitrators. Um, I don't want the default to be that arbitrators must pay for their, their travel costs. I think if the case calls for it, and it's a case that the parties are willing to invite the arbitrator over to hear their case, um, the proper treatment for the arbitrators to make sure their, their um, arbitrator fees and enumerations are covered and also that their expenditure is covered. So I did not want to create some nudge that would suggest that arbitrators or young arbitrators should feel that they have to bear their own costs. But even, even having said that, there has been cases in the past where we know of young arbitrators who frequently visit Korea for for cases or existing councils or to just to, or for just courtesy tour visits. Um, and they have a particular nexus to Korea for whatever reason. Um, and if they have these characteristics that seem a perfect fit for a certain case, maybe the governing law is something that they know about, or maybe it's a particular expertise that these young arbitrators are known for. We make a separate independent inquiry saying that you are being considered, but because of the client's expectations on costs, um, that it would be helpful that you would make an accommodation of this part or that part. Um, but we, we never ask them to bear the costs entirely of their own. For example, we would ask them, could you waive the business class air Fair and instead claim only the, the, the standard airfare. Um, the, the, then we would do that on a case by case basis, but we don't, as far as I recollect, we don't have a feature in the application where the arbitrators um, are encouraged to indicate their preference to be reimbursed for their travel costs. I think that's very uh, insightful, very interesting to. Uh... To learn about also how the institutions care about the arbitrators, I mean the young arbitrators, because it is true that uh, in, in smaller cases, sometimes it's really, you're not doing it for free, but it's uh, really like uh, not that many fees. So if on top of that, you you really incur a lot of expenses, it may, this may be a danger also for young, uh, young arbitrators, you know, who, who want to do it all, you know. Um, so I think uh, we, we have learned a lot about the process and the, the, the opportunities, what kind of uh, young arbitrators you, you, you are on the lookout for. Um, just maybe one last question, you know, uh, to, to ask, to conclude, do you generally, uh, you or your colleagues at the KCB, when you have to make the appointments, we all, I mean, have our own networks, our own list. We have uh, people who come to mind, you know, when we see a, a given dispute. But do you also, like, sometimes consult the rosters or the arbitrators' databases uh, uh, of uh, other countries, but also the global ones? And would, for instance, like a, a high uh, arbitrators' database with the details on the profile of the members, is that something that your colleagues would consider uh, consulting? Uh, or do you consult this type of, uh, of databases already? Mm, so if I understood correctly, do, do we consult other lists that exist yes. in other institutions? Yes, and, and, no, and I mean uh, uh, more like uh, publicly available databases, for instance, like the Swiss Arbitration Association as one, you know, it's not mm -hmm. the institution, it's just an association. Or, you know, for instance, HAI has a list of all its uh, members on its, uh, on its uh, website. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we may expand maybe on the details of members. So mm -hmm. it's interesting, you know, also for us to know whether some people look at this, you know, and the people who matter uh, in terms of appointments. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so thinking also there's... about, uh, yeah, maybe ICA or Arbitrators Intelligence, yeah. this type of databases are mm -hmm. having. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, 
ICA or arbitrary intelligence, those are tools that we know about um, since it's covered very well in, in the media. Um, and any list that um, is considered by the arbitration, the global arbitration community in general as being reliable and has and as being something that is vetted by proper reputational checks, that is something that we would be keen to, to refer to. Um, until now, we have relied on the roster of the KCAB panel because the names there and the organizations that they're associated with um, are, are already, already carry certain um, reputational um, credibility. Um, but I think if we have continued to have a larger number of cases and we, we need to look farther away, definitely those lists such as the Sky um, Association list or or, or the, the 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 as a list would definitely be lists that we would look to in order to check for the credentials or the reliability or or market reputation of an arbitrator arbitrator's uh, arbitrator's profile. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sue. I mean, it was uh, very insightful. We learned a lot about uh, the KCAB practice. Uh, so if you don't have anything to add that you would like to share with us, uh, I will thank you for your time today and uh, say goodbye to all audience. Okay, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.